I would have loved to see everybody that's on the Zoom here, but that's okay. And I praise God for everyone that made it out here. My hope, my desire is that every fourth Tuesday, we do have more and more people that will come together because I want to challenge us to exercise while we have the, um, let's just say the convenience of being in our own place and we're not, you know, stepping out into a public arena to risk public embarrassment <laughs> because we want to, we want to stretch ourselves to move more in these gifts so that gifts don't just operate when people meet in church. Gifts operate wherever the person is, whenever the time comes for any individual to move forward in the gifts of the spirit. And so uh, <laughs> let me just open up in a, in a very brief word of prayer. And, and I say, Father God, I thank you for everyone that is here this evening. I ask, Lord, that as we go into the word, that the word opens up for us. I pray, Lord, that whatever scriptures may have been uh, on lockdown and we might not have understood, I pray that tonight the Holy Ghost opens up everything that we look at. And as a result of these things being open to us, it does something to our spirit to imbibe us with uh, a power. And that power comes because we find ourselves loving the word and loving you more. These things of the love of God, your love trigger the reality of gifts of the spirit in high operation in your people. So I pray, Father God, that for however we have been moving in gifts, seeing the miraculous, that the more that we fall in love with you, the more that we give ourselves to the word and give ourselves to you, that the greater trust you have given to us to move in the power of God, because we will be faithful to bring people back to you, to point them back to you. So tonight, let the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you come forward. Let whatever operations of gifts flow tonight between us, Father God, that we will glorify you, strengthening ourselves to be able to minister to the lost wherever we find them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, folks, this is what we're going to do. Can everybody see me? Of course you can. <laughs> so this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I want to, this is a Bible study, but it's a Bible study where, you know, in, in college, you have the lecture and then you have the lab. <laughs> okay. So when we do this, this is all about labbing, but, but still there's a little bit of lecture involved. And for the benefit of everybody that's online, that's listening, uh, be ready to go into the scriptures, but I want you to be aware that. Everyone is to be challenged with these things that I'm going to be bringing out here. So, uh, and, and I want to talk about something that might be fairly common um, for some people and other people may be a little awkward, but it's something that we've talked about throughout the course of the year. So what is that you're about to see? I want you to go to Acts chapter six, Acts chapter six. And I want to show you something about being in the word and the attitude of the word. So in Acts chapter six, of course, Acts chapter six is coming off of a number of different events. Of course, Acts chapter two, the, the birth of the church happens and the flow of the Holy Ghost enters into people that never had that kind of experience before. And it was the beginning of the experience that was to be common to every believer. So in Acts chapter two, there's a supernatural introduction to the world where God is in the supernatural. And people are filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. And, and they're speaking in tongues because the Holy Spirit is doing something to their spirit to release words. And these words are how God is going to train us to pray powerful prayers in a powerful way. So anyway, Acts chapter two, that happens. Acts chapter three, there's a healing. Acts chapter four, the men of God are ministering 
and catching heat from the religious leaders. Chapter 5, more heat. But in the end of chapter 4, people, when the, when the heat came on the apostles, they prayed a very powerful prayer toward the end of that chapter. And then we go into chapter 5, and we see that the glory of God is so powerful in the church in Acts chapter 5 that people needed to literally come before the apostles correct. Because if they didn't, they could die on the spot. And the reason is, when the glory of God is that strong in an environment, you have to be conscientious that you cannot come before the Lord thinking you can continue in some deviant behavior. It's going to be called out, or it might cost you your life. And that's what happened with two people in the chapter 5. Oh, anyway. So chapter 4, they prayed. The power of God came on them, and they were ministering powerfully. Great grace was upon everybody, and that great grace meant that the great presence of the Lord is there. Chapter 5, chapter 4 is the great grace. Chapter 5, people died. Chapter 6, things are coming into another head where the apostles are seeing so many people coming in that they're giving their time to be before the Lord so that when they're before the Lord, they can minister on a level that God wants them to minister. And you'll see the effect of their ministry in just a moment. So I'm in Acts chapter six. Did all that make sense that I said? I know that's a real fast, that's super fast view through chapters two, three, four, five, and into six. So in chapter six, here's the apostles. And, and groups of people, numbers of people, it's just growing like crazy. So in chapter six, verse one, it says, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily menstruation. So this is not good. There, there should not be any murmuring or contention or any of that. So anyway, then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples. And notice, it's not just, I know we know this, but some people don't. It's a multitude of disciples. It's not just 12. It's not just 11. It's not just 12. It's not just 20. It's everybody's a disciple. Why is that important? Because if everybody's a disciple and you're called into the same church, you're called into the same relationship, God is expecting you as a disciple, as a disciple, to be the kind of disciple that he was working on in the first century. He hasn't changed how he wants us to look at being disciples. It's not like, well, in the first century, these disciples, they didn't have nothing better to do. So they just, you know, hung around with the people of God and was in the Bible and prayed. But today's Christian we're busy, so we don't have time to do that. No, God's still looking for us to be a disciple, period. And the disciple, what that means is you're giving your ear. A disciple is one that has given his ear to another. You've given your ear and you've given your whole life to God. So multitude, multitude of disciples. It says in verse 12, then... The 12 called the multitude of the disciples under them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. The neglect of the ministration meant that people were being serviced, they were being taken care of, and the apostles were like, well, we need to be in the word. We need to be before God. Get somebody else to serve these people. Now, even though you could look at that in the 20th century mindset and say, well, you know, serving people, you know, that's nice, but, you know, does that really position you to do the works, to do the great things? Keep reading. It says here, the scripture says that uh, the apostles, first of all, their attitude, their attitude was, we need to be in the word. We need to be before God. We still looking at this, need to have that same kind of attitude. The apostles walked in great power. So I want you to see that they had an attitude to be in the word. 
They had an attitude to be in prayer. They walked in great power and they ministered from that level. What kind of effect did that have on the rest of the disciples? Look at this. It says in, in verse three, wherefore brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Stop right here just for one second. Ask yourself, why is it singling out Stephen and then the rest of these guys that we read, we don't see what it says. We don't see the same thing. We don't see the same thing that it says about Stephen. So there's this isolation on Stephen. And Stephen is under the ministry and the covering of the apostles. And he's serving. He's, you know, he's serving tables. But it says here, this is who he was. Because when you come into the latter part of the chapter and going into chapter seven, it really expands on Stephen and what happened with him. I'm going to tell you before we even get to it, Stephen ultimately dies. But before he dies, we see this testimony. We see something written about him, that this is a man full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. Well, didn't the others have that? Yeah. But there is a reason why there's an elaboration on Stephen, because when Stephen confronts the religious leaders in that time, all of chapter 7, we're in chapter 6 right now, and we're not going to read all of chapter 6. I just wanted you to see these things. As a matter of fact, we'll go here. Let's keep reading. Verse 5 again. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nacar, and Timon, and, per and Parmesis, or Parmenas, Parmenas, okay, and Nacar, Nacar, Timon, Parnassus, Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch. Forgive me for hatching through these names, but it is what it is. All right. And though, and whom the scripture says, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. So the apostles continued, but they laid hands on these men that were serving tables. They were servants. They, they had a servant's heart. They had a steward's mentality of just being responsible and taking care of something so that the apostles could do what they could do. Then the scripture goes on and it says in verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and of power, and did great wonders and miracles among the people. He wasn't an apostle. But when he was called out to serve tables, that wasn't the end of his ability. That wasn't the end of his skill set. Oh, praise the Lord, folks. <laughs> that wasn't the end of his skill set. That wasn't the end of his ability. So the scriptures are telling us that here is Stephen, who was, at the time, you know what these the, the proper name we call these guys now? They're servants, right? You know what the proper name is we call them? Deacons. Can it... Can it be that it's just men that are to serve? No, women are to serve too. <laughs> but there's a point that's being laid out here in scripture. And this is that as these men yielded under the, the direction of the Holy Ghost through other men, as the apostles stayed with their responsibility, other people that were just serving were still empowered. And here is Stephen, though he was just serving tables, doing miraculous things, so much so that it caught the attention of the religious leaders, and they felt like 
they had run into Jesus all over again. As a matter of fact, they may have been saying, we know about the other 12, but who's this guy? And it didn't just stop at Stephen. I just want you to see that as the church began and people committed themselves to the word of God, as the apostles were committed to the word of God, and then other responsibilities were discovered that needed to be addressed as people gave themselves over to those responsibilities, yet gave themselves over to continue in the things of God, they were still very powerful out in the street. Out in the street. This is where we want to be. Out in the street. Now, before I read any further, this is an open forum, not, not necessarily open forum, this, that's the other, but you always can talk. So what, what feedback do you have about this so far? If any. And if you're going to say something, pick up the mic, hit the on button, <laughs> hit the on button, because you have, I don't know how many people are on right now. I can hear people logging on to the Zoom. So when you talk, if you're saying something, they won't be able to hear you unless you turn the mic on and speak into the mic. So anybody want to say anything at this point? Because I will keep moving forward, and then we can come back and visit some things. You want me to just keep moving forward? Is there anybody that is uh, logged in that has something that you'd like to say in reflection before I go any further? Okay. All right. So this is what we're going to do. So are you tracking with me? The apostles stayed focused on what they needed to do. The newly appointed deacons who were just servants were committed to what they were doing, but though they were just serving tables, it did not diminish the power of God in them. And the scriptures are pointing out one guy in particular. I would submit to you, all these guys were moving in the power of God, all of them. The scripture just singles out him for a moment and is going to get to another guy in a little bit further down the road. But looking at, at, at Philip, I mean, Stephen, rather, it says in verse 8, again, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So, not just a little bit of something, the scripture says, great, that word is great, right? And miracles, and wonders. So it's not just some small thing. I want you to understand that whatever the apostles were doing, this guy was doing. Yet he was faithful in the task that he had been assigned to help serve the tables. Then the scripture says, oh, do you want to say something? Pick up the mic. <laughs> All y'all got to do to get my attention is pick up the mic. <laughs> What would you say is the difference between wonders and miracles? Miracles are, these are supernatural. It's a very good question. <laughs> it might not be a lot of difference, except when the miracles happen, we do have something given to us by God called the working of miracles. Miracles. And miracles are supernatural interventions of God to step into a situation where we're maybe looking for a desired result, such as a miracle healing or a miracle deliverance, because the scripture says the works of power of Jesus, when demons were cast out of people, the scripture says this miracle of deliverance. So it's an act of power. Now, a wonder, this is my definition, this might not be the complete definition, but a wonder is something that you look at and you know it's God and you're saying to yourself, man, that'll make you wonder. <laughs> you just don't have any other words for that. It's like, that is really out there. <laughs> so wonders are things that are profoundly different. They're just profoundly different. Does that help? 
That makes you have something you'd like to say about that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's all, here's the key thing. It's all supernatural. It is not normal. It is totally not normal. It is all supernatural. And we have gifts that bring miracles and we have wonders. Wonders can be things like God does something and you're not necessarily involved. Like the Bible says in Acts 2, and I will show wonders in the heaven above. When, here's a wonder, when Joshua spoke to the universe, literally spoke to our solar system and said, sun, stand still, moon, hold your place. You're not just speaking about, you know, some kite up in the sky that you're manipulating. You're talking about the sun. <laughs> and the moon and that's a wonder that's like that's really out there so that helped okay all right so okay so now here's just going a little bit further it says in verse nine this is kind of what i want to get to uh all of it i want to i wanted to elaborate on but verse nine then there arose certain of the synagogue which which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cy Cyrenians, Cyrene, Cyren, Sirens. I'm going fast. You, you've got Sire, Sire. Well, anyway, yes, Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and of them of Cilia, Cilcia and of Asia disputing. You see this part right here? Disputing with Stephen. He's doing signs and wonders and miracles, and then people are arguing with him. People are arguing with him. Now, I want to get to that part, because by the time we get to the end of chapter 5, these religious people, they're not doing any signs. They're not doing any wonders. They're not doing anything except what is humanly normal. What is humanly normal? Stevens operating on a completely different level, and so they want to dispute that. And so then, when you get to when you get to um, verse fifteen, it says this one thing. It says, "And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him. Stephen saw his face as it had been the face of an angel." They're looking at something that's glorious and they don't like what they're seeing. And then, starting at verse 1, it says, And then said the high priest, uh, Are these things so? And he said, Men and brethren, fathers, hearken, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Now, this is Stephen. This is the servant. He's about to go 60 verses into chapter 7, going from the beginning up to this point of history, recounting for them what God has been doing as noted in Scripture. My point is, the apostles were focused on Scripture. Here is Stephen quoting them things out of the Scripture from the law, from the poets from the prophets, and he's just going through it all. And by the time he gets through it all, they're like insulted. Like, who are you to say these things to us? And then they pick up stones and then they stone him to death. Why do I want to show you that? Because even in the early days of the church with people that were considered just servants, they were still very powerful powerful like you in the last days this what we're reading about this is a glorious church but it is the it is the early rain church we are in the latter rain church the early rain the early pouring out of the holy ghost and people are filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues and building up their spirit so that they can move with God supernaturally now we're in the latter reign where the glory that god is intending on us 
will be greater than we see on any of the first century church. And here is just one of the guys who was not an apostle, who was doing these amazing things. And then when you go into chapter 8, look at chapter 8. It says here in chapter 8, it ends, chapter 7 ends with uh, Paul before he before he was called Paul, he was called Saul, and Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen. So Stephen's murdered. He's stoned. When we get into chapter 8, there's a tremendous persecution on the church, but it doesn't slow the word down. It, maybe it just picks up steam with persecution. And we're living, we're living in the day where there's this intense persecution that started, we're starting to feel it. We're starting to feel the pressure. Okay, so when when you get into chapter eight, Paul, the very first verse says, and and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to the prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere doing what? Preaching. It's like, you're not going to slow us down. <laughs> you're not going to slow us down. And then when you come to, they're out there preaching. And then it says, verse 5, Then Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing what? The miracles which he did. He is just another servant, and he's moving out like everybody else. But as he's preaching, same kind of things that he's seeing, he's seeing it because it was the ministry of the apostles. They saw it because it was the ministry of Jesus. And we're to see these things here are what we are to see, but in this day, the scripture says that the glory on the latter house, us, will be greater than the former house. This is where we're going. So when we look at what's happening here with Philip, verse 7, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. My point, the apostles were appointed to do what they did, but their ministry was to minister to the people to become men and women of God of the kingdom, just like they were. Is everybody with me? Okay, so now, just having said that, um, two things, and then we're going to try something here. First Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians 14. Just turn to that. If we see, and, and when we look at the book of Acts, let me say this. It's kind of important to notice where people went. Like when you're reading through the letters, like we're about to open up uh, the 14th chapter of First Corinthians. Well, in the book of Acts, it talks about a place called Corinth. It was a city. And when the city embraced the message that was preached, in the beginning of that city, um, in the beginning of the ministry that went to that city, the Bible says in a, in a place that I had everybody looking for several months, in the 19th chapter of Acts, in the second verse, well, the first verse says, now when um, it says uh, Paulus left Ephesus, Paul came to Corinth and finding certain disciples. Paul went, let me see, do I have that backwards? Yeah, I might have that backwards. Uh, let me see, let me make sure I quote it correctly. Acts 19 and looking at the first verse 
And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through, came to the upper coast. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. So the Bible is mentioning Corinth. The Bible is mentioning Ephesus. We've got the letter to the Ephesians. We've got the letter to the Corinthians. Okay? And, and the question that I had everybody asking was, when Paul went to Ephesus and he found the disciples there, he said to them, y'all know the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we have not so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then Paul says, hmm, so how were you guys baptized? And they said, we were baptized under John's baptism. And then Paul says, hmm, that's very good. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him that should come after him, after John, that is, on Christ Jesus. And then when Paul explained that, the scripture says when they heard this, they were baptized, and Paul had laid his hands on them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues and prophesy. Now, we had covered that. Paul laid his hands on them. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues and prophesy. And, and the whole number of them was about 12. And they were all baptized. They were baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, this happened in Ephesus. Whatever was happening in Ephesus, however Paul was teaching in Ephesus, that was the teaching that was going on in Corinth. And in Ephesus, you don't see where in Ephesus it talks about tongues. Although when they were first presented the gospel there, they're speaking in tongues. Then in Corinth, when you're reading Acts, when they go to Corinth, you don't hear about them speaking in tongues in Corinth. But when you go to the book, of 1 Corinthians, you'll see chapters 12, 13, and 14 is about the gifts of the Spirit. Chapter 14 is about the, the uh, uh, tongues and how things should go with the tongues. Everybody's with me, right? So these were the beginning phases of the church, and everybody, everybody was exposed to the Holy Ghost and tongues. Everybody was to be developing in some form of a supernatural ministry because that's what Jesus did. That's what the apostles did. And that's what the church was being trained to do. Somewhere along the line, we have lost sight of that. But tonight is about rekindling the understanding and exercising ourselves in this. So, everybody with me so far? Yes. So, in chapter... 14. I did say go to 1 Corinthians 14. Um, I want to show you something here. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And uh, let's see here. We're going to start at around, well, we can read verses, uh, the 14th chapter, verses 1 and 2, where it says, very important thing, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. So number one, of which I could take days talking about this one verse, follow charity, follow love, follow the love of God, follow the love that comes from God, and then desire all these gifts. Make sure what you are after is God first. You, you're allowing yourself to fall in love with God. If you'll do that, these gifts will come up out of you and you'll minister these gifts because of the love that kind of pushes it out of you. So it says here, follow up to charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may what? Prophesy. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. So tongues, like on the day of Pentecost, came, they're unknown, to the people that's speaking, but they might be known to the people that are listening. And then again, they might not because in the 12th chapter of this book, the 12th chapter says there are different 
kinds of tongues. So let's, for the sake of argument, just say, okay, there's at least two. There's the tongues that people will understand if you say it, and then there's tongues that people will not understand because you're talking to God. Two different kinds of tongues, okay? So, Corinth had to be educated on this. They needed to, to really understand what the tongues were about because not understanding it, they were kind of abusing it. And Paul, in his letter, was helping them to understand, guys, let me help you understand what the tongues are all about. So that's what's going on in the 14th chapter. But I want to kind of hone in on something specific when we get to chapter 1421. In chapter 1421, I'm going to leave off talking about why tongues are there and what it does and everything else. But I want to get to this 21st verse. And it says in verse 21, in the Old Testament, God had, had talked about tongues. He talked about it coming. And in verse 21, this is something that's quoted out of Isaiah. It says, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues, and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. So Paul writing this is saying, God has been talking about tongues all the way back into Isaiah, and there's not been this clear understanding of what it's about, but I'm here to help you to understand it. So then he says, um, verse 20, 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Why is it a sign to them that don't believe? Because people that are non-believers, seeing you speaking in tongues, helps them to make the connection that something supernatural is going on here. So for the believer, it's not a sign. For the believer, it's actually an advanced form of communication. It's not a sign. It's more functional, okay? For the loss, it's a sign. Something's going on. This is something from God. So the scripture says, uh, it is not a sign, it, for, it is a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not them that believe not, but for them which believe. Prophecy is there to help serve the body. It's to help to build the body. So who can prophesy? Everybody. Remember, we read in Acts 12, I mean, Acts 19, that the men spoke in tongues and prophesied right there. Then here, Paul is about to say, he's, he's going to help straighten something out. If therefore the whole church were to come together under one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say you are all mad, right? Because they're y'all just saying babbles, nothing. They don't understand, okay? They don't understand. But 24, but if all prophesy, all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not or unlearned, he is convinced of all, and he is judged by all, I mean, is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God. That's what we want. We want when we minister for people to look beyond us and start seeing God and that they'll recognize this is the work of God. And they'll connect. And that's what we want. We don't want the attention. We want God to have the attention. Amen? But here's a key thing. Paul says, but if all prophesy. Well, Paul, is that practical? Can, can everybody prophesy? Well, he says this several times. But if all prophesy in verse 24. And then he says, um, in verse 31, he says it plainly. For ye may all prophesy. He says, for ye may all prophesy, one by one, that all may learn 
and all may be comforted. Now, he says, hear all in verse 31. He says, um, 24, all prophesy in verse 24. And I'm getting the impression <laughs> that everyone can prophesy. A matter of fact, when we enter into the doggone chapter, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may what? Prophesy. He wants us all to be able to prophesy. He wants us all to be able to move in the supernatural realm of speaking things that come from God. All of us. Some people will say, well, well, okay, maybe prophecy, but maybe, maybe that's true. But is everybody supposed to speak in tongues? Because I've heard you say that you should speak in tongues. But there's the scripture saying all may prophesy. Look at verse 5, chapter 14, verse 5. <laughs> chapter 14, verse 5 says, uh, let's see. I would, or I want, that you all spoke with tongues. He wants us all to prophesy. He wants us all to speak in tongues. Why do you speak in tongues? Because speaking in tongues, again, this is the most that I really want to say about it without going too deep. It's an advanced form of prayer. That's what it is. It's all it is. It's an advanced form of prayer. What it does is it charges up your spirit so that as you're doing this, you get more confidence to prophesy and maybe even move in the miraculous and maybe even see a wonder or two. <laughs> Please. Oh, okay. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Um, I'm going to ask that. I've been talking quite a bit, and I've put a, a bit out here. So let me have a little more feedback from everybody. What do you think about what I'm saying here? And you know where this is going. We're going to do a little exercise. <laughs> but give me your thoughts. Now it's too quiet, right? <laughs> okay. Pastor Jeff, I want to um, say I think, and I might be wrong, but I think in reference to prophecy, um, it has to do with, I think, your measure of faith to believe that the Lord will use you to prophesy. Say that one more time, Sylvia. So just before you said prophesy, you said what? Yeah, I think it, you know, because I prophesy every now and then, but I think it has to do was your measure of faith to believe that the Lord will use you to prophesy? Because I know when I first started, I got I kept getting like one word, two words, yes. one word, two words. And so I just stepped out there and just Yes. You know? Yes. Faith to prophesy. That's what you were saying? Yes. Yes. And I I remember those early days, Sylvia. But we, won't, my we, won't talk about, we won't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I see, Lewis, you picked up the mic. So speaking to the mic, is it on? Yes. Actually, how to turn this <laughs> right, So, Pastor, what, I, what I'm getting about the Apostle Paul here, um, saying that he prefers for us to prophesy because when we're prophesying, we're getting word basically directly from the Holy Spirit, directly to God. That starts to show that we have a communication with Him. Yes. Because I can probably say, yes, I'm hearing from God, but how do I prove it? But when things are coming out of me that are coming on behalf of God, and it does minister to people, and yes. I think that's what Paul is really trying to Tell us that that's what we want. That yes. Is, because we do edify ourselves when we do talk in tongues. Because like I said, we are building ourselves up. We are getting stronger. Yes. Able to prophesy. Yes, yes, yes. This should really take us into when we're, when we're studying the word, we're looking at prophetic things everywhere, every word. When we're studying the word, the words of God have life that go into it. When we're praying, we're releasing words. And when we're receiving words from the scripture and we're saying words in prayer, our prayers can become more prophetic. 
more prophetic. See, let me, let me help people to understand. There's prayers that people will pray out of very self-centered motivation. And the will of God is in another universe. <laughs> they are so far from it because it's things that they want. And we've got to, we, this is why the emphasis is follow after charity, fall in love with the Lord. As you fall in love with the Lord, you and his mind become more in sync and you know what the will of God is. And when you have the confidence of the will of God, you begin to say things, you begin to believe with greater intensity that as you're studying the word and these things are coming out of you based in love, you'll know that you're very, really in sync with God when you're walking in, in the love. Because I'm still in chapter 14. Look at the essence of what it says about prophecy in verse 4. Uh, let me see here. Uh, it says, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 3. It says, but he that prophesies speaketh unto men to three things, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Edification, exhortation, comfort. You're building somebody. You are, you are encouraging, you're urging them to move forward and you're giving them a sense of comfort or you're speaking with the peace of God into their lives. The foundation that you're building from that you're saying these words of edification, that you're saying these words of comfort, that you're saying these words of exhortation is coming from a base of love. This is how you know, I know this is God. Please speak. So, My wife knows a lot about this. Go ahead. I'm actually going to ask a question. Well, now I just flipped it for you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so the first thing that comes to mind is when people read the word, they talk about the gift of prophecy. So I think even early on, people thought, okay, well, that's not my gift. You know, I think my gift is A, B, or C. And I know the Lord had taught me earlier that desire all the gifts. And he'll, yes. give it, he'll give it all to us to operate as needed. Yes. So it's not just, okay, I got the gift of prophecy. What gift do you have? So I, I think to, just to kind of clear that up, because I believe everyone can prophesy. I believe the Lord sp speaks to everyone. Yes. And then it's just getting over that fear. I know when I first started, um, most of the message was in my mind and I would speak it. So, and then, you know, as faith, grows you know you just you know grow with it and it's always amazing to me that when you're prophesying you're like I should have wrote somebody should have wrote that down what did I say yes <laughs> it's like it's like that didn't come from me you know and I'm trying to speak but then I'm trying to listen and then I'm trying to remember and then when I get too much involved it kind of gets jumbled up messed up and the message may not come out the best but I was also going to say um it says for edification, exhortation, and comfort. So what about those types of prophecies? Because we used to get them uh, where they were more like warnings, more like, um, you know, beware. And some of the things that, that was prophesied actually came to pass. Um, so... I don't know what category of exhortation. Maybe it is definitely within the category of exhortation. exhortation okay. Because it is it's a not warning. It's always comforting. I mean, I'm yeah. it's yes. always comforting, but it's like, wake up, my sheep. Yes. You know, those kind of, it is an example. So, yeah. When we were in our early stages of development, I felt that the Lord looked at this group because we were an on fire group of people. We weren't just trying to go to church because it was the right thing to do. We were going to church. We were going, we were meeting together because we love God. We loved each other. And all we wanted to do was whatever the Lord is saying. We're just on fire. So we could, <clears throat> we could hear those comforting um, prayers or comforting prophecies 
that would begin to be followed up with com with with prophecies that would have a more urgent message a more urgent message because we're in this time we're in this last days where the clock is ticking and more than ever as we're looking at the world the clock is ticking seems like it's faster and faster yes and even one of the main things that hold true today that we heard over and over and over and over again keep your eye on the beast yes keep your eye on the Keep your eye on the east. Yeah, and the Lord taught us early on to pray for Israel. Yes. Here we are again. Here we are. Here we are again, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I, I try to write down, if I'm not prophesying, I'll try to write down what's being said. Sometimes I forget because I'm so into listening to it. But, um, you know, it's just amazing to hear prophecy and to watch things come to pass that were prophesied, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes you might can't judge it immediately, and sometimes it could sound really far off, and then all of a sudden it's <laughs> It's right there. <laughs> yes. Good. Anyone else? Um, I wanted to share a prophecy there that you guys are talking about back in the day, and I think it's... Uh, would be helpful now. The prophecy was no time for fun and frolic. I forgot about that one. No, no time. Again, Sylvia. The, the, the prophecy, no time for fun and frolic. Yeah, no fun, no time for fun and frolic. And that's where we are now. And you know, the funny thing, when I first heard that. Is the time, mic on? Yeah. Okay. When I first heard that prophecy, Sylvia, I'm like, oh, man, no fun. <laughs> That's the first thing that went through my mind. And then it got a little more serious, you know. Yeah. I really understood. Yeah. Amen. Think about this, folks. What is exhortation? What What does that mean? This is This is where you are free to speak up. <laughs> I always thought it meant to build. What is that? To build to or to build up. Yes, there's definitely an element of that. Yes. Ron, you were about to say something. Things to come. But things to come. Wonders or sometimes make sure that you're ready because as the prophecy came forth, be ready. Um, no more time for playing. And it doesn't mean that we can't have fun, but it means no more time to play with God. You got Amen. to get serious. Amen. Amen. See, yeah. there is a thing called joy in the Holy Ghost, right? You right. can have fun, but don't take things for granted when God wants us to be serious. There's a time, the Bible says that for every season, for everything, there is a time, right? So there's a time to have fun, then there's a time to really double down. So, but you were going to say something? No. Oh, okay. well, thank is you, like, Mike, please. Just, I just make sure people understand. All right, I hear somebody on, on, online saying something. Yeah, I wanted to say that um, in prophecy, I, what I got was that uh, it's a, making you aware, aware. It's like warning you. Uh, exhortation. Yes, exactly. Ron, exactly. Ron was saying that. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Yeah, confirmation. Okay. Yes. So, so then just on that then, um, how do you, no, 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 let me ask the question this way. Does prophecy always have to be future or can prophecy be now it could be now i think people get a little intimidated with thinking that if i prophesy am i supposed to be talking about the future no no there's a there's gifts all of the gifts of the spirit are just kind of like the the like rainbow colors forget the lgbtq thing but rainbow colors <laughs> that bleed into each other you can distinctly see the red 
but the red kind of bleeds into the next color or the blue bleeds into the next. These gifts kind of bleed into each other. There's a central point where they can be distinct, but they can bleed into each other. So prophecy does not have to have a future a connotation. It can be for right now. And that's why we exercise to say things that we believe the Lord is saying in the moment to help build somebody now. And it can come, I would encourage people more and more, I'm feeling when you have a word coming, you don't necessarily have to say, thus saith the Lord. But I think to, you know, some people feel, I just got to say, no, you don't. No, you don't. But you can say, I believe the Lord is saying this. I believe the Lord is saying that. Because when we start with the thus saith the Lord, it's, we may have a tendency to want to put that on the same level of authority as the scripture. We're not trying to do that. But that word can have as much effect and be embraced as much if it's, I believe that this is what the Lord is saying. And, and I'm saying that for the sake of people that feel like, I feel nervous saying, thus saith the Lord. Well, then don't say that. <laughs> say, I believe the Lord is saying this, and then roll. Yeah. My people know my voice. If it's from the Lord, those who know God will know. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. But you bring up an interesting point of things bleeding into each other because, you know, when I hear something um, like a word of knowledge, but it's spoken prophetically, it seems like that it should be like a distinct difference. This is prophecy. This is the word. But they seem to do bleed into each other. Yeah. I don't know. It's the same. The Bible's. Same, same the, the, the specific scripture says that is the same spirit that gives these gifts, the same spirit. And we can't like lock God into, if this is a word of knowledge, this is the only way it can operate. No, there's some word of knowledge element to a word of knowledge with a little word of wisdom to it that might even have a little bit of discerning of spirits that opens up a vision to see something. This, this, this area is where we're learning, where we're learning all of this from God. But but nothing is like, you know, he doesn't have to be, you know, locked into our rules. Go ahead. Yeah, Okay, so here we go. Word. Of, let me say it this way, folks. Here we go. I know where you're at. Word of wisdom has a future has a future element to it, and this is the future element. God's going to show you how to do something. Now, the way it comes may be in the moment, but it's. I'm just going to show you how to do this. This is a word of knowledge to show you how to do something you don't know how to do. And you haven't done it yet, <laughs> but you're going to do it. So there's this element of a word of, of knowledge that has a future connotation to it. A word of knowledge can go everywhere from, I'm going to show you how to, I'm going to show you how to uh, turn your car on. All the way to, I'm going to show you what's going to be happening next year and it comes as a word of wisdom what is happening in the next year and that comes with prophecy and a word of uh, uh wisdom word of knowledge deals with some fact of what what is now or what has been a word of knowledge can be now and what has been a word of wisdom can be kind of like now before what's going to happen Everybody with me? And when you're prophesying, your prophecy can have words of knowledge in it. It can have words of wisdom in it. But for all sake, for all intents and purposes, if we just, because we're just trying to exercise, we just want to say things that are based in love to help, at the very least, encourage another person. 
and and we don't have to go into the dynamics of future and wow if i say this and it didn't come to pass oh man i miss god don't put that pressure on yourself don't put that kind of pressure on yourself just look to encourage look to build and if there's some element of exhortation with a little you know that warning thing to it go ahead if it comes from the base of love the person or we will still sense that. Somebody was going to say something. Uh, who else? There was something somebody else wanted to say. Anyone? Oh, Jesse. There you go. Back in the day, we used to uh, somebody prophesy. They understood that it could be tested. We would. Try, try the spirit of what we do. So if they prophesied, it was going to be tested anyway. Yes. And some people would get scared if they got rebuked <laughs> and wouldn't do it again. <laughs> and we had to learn, you know, we had to learn how to do it so you could overcome that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's go ahead and dig into that just for a second. Sometimes people would say things, you can, Literally, I want us to understand that you can prophesy things to build people, to comfort them. But then there is this tendency where people will start thinking things that they want and they can prophesy out of their own heart. And if it becomes, you know, some of that you can just give a pass to. But then some things you can't give a pass to and when you can't give a pass to it, it's, for, it's with good reason. You cannot give a pass to it, and you've got to address it, because now it must be um, challenged. And when people would say these things that may come out of their heart, of course, there would be fear in that person, but in other people, too, that's like, well, I don't want to say anything. But we've all got to come to this point. What did we say that, that well, how did I put it? How do you spell Faith. Faith is spelled R I S K. Risk. <laughs> so you take a risk. Okay. Now that reminds me of the little comedic moment. <laughs> oh boy, I bet I know where you're going. <laughs> yeah, I remember this woman. Oh. Um. <laughs> She had prophesied that Jeff was going to be her husband. And I'm like, yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> not, that I, not that I couldn't have accepted that, but I it just was like, yeah. anyway. Yes, she had prophesied that I was going to be her husband, and I was not feeling that at all. <laughs> I was not. And she became, maybe you don't know this, maybe you do. But she became a little bit more aggressive, wanting to stress, this is what the Lord prophesied. And I'm like, not buying it. <laughs> not buying it. So, yeah, you, people can prophesy things that they want out of their heart. So, yes, we need to be aware of that. Yeah. I have an example. Um, when I prophesied, I, when I prophesied, uh, no time for fun and frolic. Uh, I got a call from the pastor, and I was like, uh, the pastor said, I tell you, you definitely you definitely have wisdom and the love of God. And I was like, yes, Pastor Jeff. So Pastor Jeff said, well, Sylvia, I just called uh, to let you know that the prophecy, because you were out of town. Somebody called and told you, told on me, Pastor Jeff, anyway. So anyway, you were out of town, and you called, and you said, I just called to let you know. And you, you gave me this scripture. You said that that was uh, of the Lord. Amen. 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 Uh -huh. So now, here we are, folks. What can we do before we conclude this evening? And everyone that's listening that's on, what can we do to move forward in this? I will tell you. You need to believe that you can prophesy. You need to, just like you believe you can speak in tongues, you can speak in tongues whenever you want to. You, 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 you have to believe that the tongues 
are there to help strengthen you to have faith that you can move beyond the words that you don't know and begin to say words that you do know because there's this inspiration that God has given you to speak a word. But this is why everything is grounded in love. And so if there's a word to be given, you don't step right out and say, uh, <laughs> you know, you just heard about prophecy for the first time. Thus saith the Lord, Russia is going to attack China and China <laughs> is going to blow up. You don't want to prophesy that. <laughs> you know, future events, make it sound prophetic. No, maybe um, this is the word of the Lord for you that you're... <laughs> you're going to uh, experience more of the goodness of God as you give yourself over to him. The Lord says he's going to open up things to you as you yield time to him. Okay, you're saying that to build somebody up. That can be a true word of prophecy. That can be an exhortation. That can be comforting. That can be definitely, hopefully, building. You don't have to go swing for the fences, you know, <laughs> to, to, to do this home run prophecy. Just look, have it in your heart to build somebody. So what you do is you first start with, I believe that I can do it because the scripture says it. I believe that I can build somebody because the scripture says it. I believe that the Lord wants me to do it because he says in the scripture, I would that you all prophesy, just like I would that you all spoke with tongues where we speak in tongues. The next step of faith is to believe you can prophesy and say something encouraging to somebody. Amen. We've done a little bit of that before, but now I'm just saying, let's look at it from this area of prophecy and begin to believe that more and more prophetic things can come out of you, that your prayers can become more prophetic, that as you're looking at scripture and you're praying to God and scripture's coming to you, when you say these scriptures, there's this prophetic element to the things you're saying in prayer. But to exercise just a little bit, we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to pray in tongues, believing our spirit is being built up. Because, you know, I want to say this. One of the, one of the, um, one, one of many things that people that don't speak in tongues will say it's why are you speaking in tongues anyway? Because it, it doesn't mean anything. Maybe it just makes you feel good. Okay? That's what they'll say. But what they're not understanding is that when you're, when you're speaking in tongues, your spirit is, is exercising itself to release more and more of these gifts. So when we take the time to stir up, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter, no, 2 Timothy chapter 1, stir up that gift that is within thee. You stir it up by praying in the spirit and believing that as you do this, your spirit is going to become more sensitive and believe that you can say something prophetic. It doesn't have to be super deep. Definitely doesn't need to be long. <laughs> it, it just needs to be very simple, but believe it. And then the more that you do it, the more you can yield yourself to prophesy. So we're going to take a minute and we're just going to stir up our spirit by praying in the Holy Ghost and believe that you're positioning yourself to receive something that you might, the Lord might drop a word in you. And so that's what we're doing. We're just trying to see what are you dropping in me, Lord, when I stir up my, my spirit to believe I can prophesy something that can help build the church. And the building of the church begins with you as the individual being built up first. Sometimes you'll hear these people that want to speak against tongues. Well, we don't need tongues because uh, it's more important to build up the church with prophecy. Okay, I agree. So in order to build up the church with prophecy, you first need to build yourself up. So let's first build ourselves up and then let's believe the Lord to give us a prophetic word to say. And if you get something, take the risk to just say it. But let's take about a minute. Is that okay? Just take about a minute. Let's stir ourselves up. 
and pray in the Holy Ghost starting now. Father, give us words. Let there be prophetic things that we can say to build up each other, knowing it's the will of God. Yeah, let's just take another 30 seconds or so, just building up yourselves, believing you'll receive something. Rote vi mala ota robo vi ba apolo ta robo ba ba to ota ek ta ma chenta tu robo la ba la malo kora te Evropa ve maso brota brota te Evropa vi 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 bes he ramola no ta brota Evropa fo ba sa brota Evropa vi vi li ata robo vi ba branda la na na tu robo vi be chi a che brota mala kora a brota mona to te chabota a ka mala tu robo va maso ra tu robo vi bes bless you father. Bless you, Father. Bless you, Father. Bless you, Father. And if you feel that the Lord has given you something, for example, the Lord says, Count it not a small thing that you would speak to me in those tongues that I've given you, that you might speak to men in languages that they understand, that they might understand me and the words that I say in the moment that I give them to you that may be very strengthening and building and encouraging to them in the moment that they've needed it. So trust me as I give you these things. Do not delay, do not talk yourself out of what I give you that can be a blessing to others as you yield to me in prophetic flow. Thank you, Lord. That's prophecy. Okay. Okay. Um, Amen. <laughs> so I'm just modeling it for you. You can, whatever God drops in your spirit. Okay. I believe I heard the Lord, the Lord say, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing the word of God, the Lord says, grow in faith. Amen. 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 If you need to, just keep stirring a little bit. If you feel there's something happening there, lean into it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And if you receive something, and we've done this a number of times, if you receive something that can be a benefit to someone specific, say that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We'll just wait another minute <clears throat> and then step out there. Take the risk. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you. Okay, who wants to jump out there? Sylvia did. I gave you an example. Yes. It's just one word, love. We receive it. <laughs> Everybody hear that? Just one word, love. Yes. I believe it's about love. I believe it's that when you do go out to minister, come from a place of love. Um, basically, he's showing me how you may be receiving some some um, vibe. I don't want to say real vibe, but you may be feeling something from a person that's not coming from love, and but your response is to come out of love that will really basically in essence help that person Amen. To grow. And, and you know and I guess it helps us to be stronger too um when we continue to allow love to just just to operate in love just continue to operate in love as we interact with other people. Amen. Amen. I keep getting in my spirit love is a choice. Choose love. Yeah. Choose love over all things. Choose love. Amen. Amen. Okay. 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 Anyone else? Colossians says that we should be knit together in love. Amen. Lewis, I see you got the mic. <laughs> yeah. As we were praying, I kept on giving that the Every gift that the Holy Spirit has for us, he's already given it to us. The only thing that keeps blocking us is us. We are our own worst enemy as far as not accepting what God has already done in us. We keep on looking for something that we already possess, but we are scared to step out and do what God has told us what to do. Every perfect gift is ours. And Amen. We're, we're having the mindset of Christ to have our renew our minds to think like Christ. That's what we need to do. And that's one thing we are really lacking is the way we think and we allow our brains to get it our way. Amen. Amen. Yes. I'll press the uh, button. things around us what's going on we gotta be like a horse with those you know, blinders blinders mm -hmm. stay focused on god no matter what but the prayer the prayers praying in the spirit it is the thing that's going to build us up to that level of faith that we can do all things amen 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 <laughs> Oh, Jesse, I thought you were <laughs> reaching for the mic to say something. <laughs> okay. All right. I heard um, pray for peace um, in the earth. God not will enthrone um, the earth. The peace, just like the joy that passeth all understanding, but the kind of peace in the midst of storms, because storms are coming. But my people shall have peace whose mind is stayed on them. Amen. Amen. I believe that the Lord was saying, remember Peter throughout the time that he was with me. I rebuked him from time to time I had to rebuke him. I still love him. Mm. Amen. Yes. All right, folks. Well, I suppose that will conclude our exercise for tonight. <laughs> Unless there's anything else anybody would like to say. 
Uh, I didn't mean to keep us here this long, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up so that people that are taking a long trip home can get home. <laughs> and, all right. I, and I know that. You know what? I know that, but I'm still being considerate of that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. So to everyone, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. And we're going to conclude but just by saying amen. And we look forward to seeing you this Sunday. This is Testimony Sunday. Bring a friend. Hopefully, the next time that we have the face-to-face -face Breakthrough Tuesday, we have more people here. I'm, I'm more inclined that when people are here that have never been here to open ourselves up to pray for people and their needs, whether it's um, healing or deliverance or breakthrough miracle or whatever it might be, but we got to bring them into this environment. So um, that being said, we've dismissed by saying amen. So I love you all. Drive you with God, of course. Be safe. And uh, until we see you Sunday. <laughs>